please open your Bibles up to, uh, if you will, please, 2 uh, Corinthians. 2 Corinthians and chapter 1, actually, in 2 Corinthians. And I would like to uh, just continue a little on a theme that we looked at several weeks ago and uh, preach, if the Lord allows it, a practical message that is intended to be a spiritual help, a spiritual encouragement. I think every one of us, as this new year begins, I think it would be appropriate for each of us to have goals spiritually. Don't you think so? I'm not against New Year's resolutions, to be honest with you. I, I like what Charlie said Sunday, and it's been said a lot of times, but I think it's an important point. You aim at nothing, and you'll hit it. And so it isn't always that you'll accomplish everything that you desire to accomplish, but if you don't try to accomplish anything, you'll probably succeed at that. And so if we want to succeed at something, we want to not just succeed at something, but have something be better in our lives. That's, that's an honorable, it's a wonderful thing. And uh, so I want to, uh, if you will this evening, be a little bit philosophical about, about spiritual steps or spiritual growth in the sense that I want us to understand that it's right for us to have uh, things that we determine God wants to do. Uh, I'm going to do this. Brother Taj and I are going to sit down sometime this week and we're going to list all of our teenagers that, that we have in our youth ministry. And there's probably, there's probably 50 of them, aren't there, Taj? There's probably 50 kids all in all uh, that are teenagers that come sporadically. Some of them come more faithfully. There's probably 50 of them. And um, one of the things we want to do is just look at a, a step that each of those teenagers could take spiritually and try to help them and encourage them to make that spiritual step, take that next step in their spiritual faith. That's our goal. One of our goals for our teen group this year is look at each of our teenagers and it's relocate some of them. Some of them haven't been around in a while. You know, just find out where you've been at, where, what's been going on in your life, and then find out what a spiritual step would be for each of those teenagers. And we'll be praying for them and be trying to help them that this year they would make a spiritual step. And by the way, if they make a spiritual step, guess what we're going to do? We're going to try to get them to make another one. <laughs> and another one, and another one, and another one. Because we all need to be growing, don't we? Yes. Moving forward in our faith. And so that's something, that's one of our goals. You know, Taj and I were talking about this last week. We were just talking about, man, we had a great year. And God gave us, we had a fantastic year with our youth last year. We had a lot of teenagers saved. Really, our teenagers, many of them really grew last year. But what we want is to see more of that, to see it to a greater degree, a greater extent. And so we want to have a better year this year. And so that's important to have for a goal, isn't it? Uh, I have some individual personal goals. And it's not just weight loss. Although it would be kind of fun if the large lard losers came out of hiding again this year <laughs> and had their Wednesday night competitions. So if you want to be part of that, come tell me. If you don't know what that is, it's some of us that have some lard that we need to lose and we, we have fun doing it each week and weigh in on Wednesday nights after church. Uh, that'd be all right. That's fine. I think weight loss or weight maintenance, making sure that you're physically fit, whatever those goals are, those are good things. You know, they're fine things. But honestly, for the most part, they're not terribly spiritual. You know, like uh, Paul told Timothy, he said that bodily exercise profiteth little. And he's not saying it doesn't profit at all. He just said it has a little profit. It has some good to it. Now, I'll just tell you this. I have learned from experience that not being well physically is a hindrance to being well spiritually. Haven't you? I've found that not being well physically is a hindrance to being well mentally. And so there are some things that I could do that would enable me to be better spiritually and uh, mentally. And so those things have their place, don't they? But man, I'll tell you something, folks. I, spiritually is where I want it to be at. I want God to take me to a place I've never been before, spiritually. I want God to grow me and to do things in my life that I've never, uh, that, that haven't happened in the past or to a degree that they've never happened before. And that's the way we want to approach this new year. And so I want to just uh, share something with you this evening or just preach from the Scripture, uh, just a mindset that Paul, who is writing really in a, from a place of trouble to a church that's come through some things, I want to just look at, in particular, a couple of verses. If you'll permit, 
Let's, we won't be looking back at the, these verses, but let's just begin reading in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians, and uh, or as our president would say, 2 Corinthians. And we will, <laughs> hope you don't get offended by, by that reference. Uh, we will read down to uh, verse, <clears throat> verse 9. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy our brother unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, which all the saint, which with all the saints which are in Achaia. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. Notice that. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Boy, is there any reason to go through hardship? Is there any help in hardship? I I read, uh, Brother Larry Pierre gave me a book by a pastor who had pastored a church in, in Cleveland. I think the title was Scaling the City. And uh, at the end of the, the pastor who had planted that church's life, God gave him leukemia. And he said about his leukemia, he said, I wish God had given it to me when I was 30 because of the heart that he gave me for people going through this sort of thing. He said, I could have benefited by it. He would have been around 70 at the time when he got leukemia. And he said, I wish it had happened when I was 30. Now, it's not because he enjoyed leukemia. I don't think anybody enjoys that. But just because he understood where somebody would, what someone was actually going through. And he's able to say, you know something? God is good. And God is able. And you're able to uh, triumph. And, the, and, and God's... And God has a purpose in your life, and He knew it from His own experience. And so Paul said that. And then verse 5, he said, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual, in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye all are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. Now notice our text, verse 8 and 9. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. Let's pray and let's ask the Lord to help us understand verse 9. Father, I pray that you would impress us with the truth that Paul is attempting to communicate both by the Holy Spirit to this church and to the church at Corinth. And I pray that you would help us to understand and to experience things that would help us not to trust in ourselves, but in the God who is able to raise the dead. Help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but as I'm reading along, I'm thinking, boy, this is helpful. This is good, isn't it? I mean, I don't want anyone to go through tribulation. That is, tribulation is hardship, persecution, difficulties. I, wouldn't, I don't want anyone to go through those things. But friend, it's a lie to try to say that no one goes through any hardship in life, isn't it? Boy, the, the, the notion that God doesn't want hardship in the life of any person flies in the face of what Jesus, our example, went through. It goes against what the apostles went through. And it goes against what Paul the apostle is saying to the church at Corinth they are going through. I've said this before, and it, the reality of it, the truth of it, will probably impress me to a greater degree in the future, but I know it's true that things happen in our lives so that we learn to trust God. And things happen in our lives so that we learn that we can't trust the flesh. Well, I've had a few times in my life when I've realized I can't do anything at all. you ever been through an I can't do anything at all moment? You know what I'm talking about. I, the worst disability or the worst hardship I think any person can go through is actually mental. 
I think. I'm not saying that I've suffered the degree of physical pain that anybody else here has suffered, but I'm just telling you, there's just something that is terrifying about losing your mental faculties, about just losing your ability to think. You ever been delirious? I don't, I, I don't like being delirious. I don't like talking about something and not knowing what I'm talking about. I don't like that feeling. You know, you ever had a bad, bad fever and you're literally out of your mind, you're so sick. And you realize, wow, and then you realize some of those people go through that. And that's really something. People go through things and Paul is talking about physical suffering. He describes the circumstances that they were aware he'd gone through as we were being pressed out of measure, above strength, in so much that we despaired even of life. Now, I don't know exactly what pressed out of measure is, except that the pressure of what Paul was going through, the circumstances of what he was going through, were a greater measure than what he physically was able to deal with. And the circumstances that he was going through had taken him to the place where he literally had lost hope. He despaired of life. Literally come to the place where he didn't even hope for a good outcome. That's bad. Those are bad circumstances, aren't they? When circumstances are so bad that there's no human logical reason for a good outcome, that's rough. Those are difficult times, difficult circumstances. And Paul uses that illustration, which of course the church at Corinth would be acquainted with. They'd know the particulars of what he was speaking of. He uses that illustration to say, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Again, that's another statement that you could study and you could analyze, and I think you could even overanalyze. It simply means we had no hope. There was no good outlook. There was no good outcome. And then he goes on to all of a sudden turn the whole thing on its head and say it had a good purpose. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Now that, that is a purpose statement. In other words, he said, God allowed this in my life in order that, or for the purpose that... We would learn not to trust ourselves, but to trust God. Every single one of us will come to a place when we realize we can do nothing by ourselves. And I will tell you something. One of the most humbling things, but also one of the most necessary things, is coming to a place of recognition of our need. You're one of those guys that always wants to help everybody. Mm. Are you? I am. I, it's going to be tough for me to get old. I'll be honest with you. I watched um, Melissa's twins here. Uh, Matt is here. Remember your grandpa? That guy hated being old. Uh, her grandpa, he just, he wanted to help everybody all the time. And actually, sometimes we would go to visit, and I'd have to go away. Uh, Melissa would visit. She'd say, you need to get out of here because you're always working on projects and stuff, and grandpa always tries to help you, and he can't help. He should be helping. He had a stroke uh, shortly after we were married because he was helping uh, our Uncle Russ roof his house. And he was, he was not at a place or age or time he should have been roofing houses. But you couldn't stop the guy from helping. I remember working on something, doing some varnishing on some wood, and uh, being going to bed, getting up in the morning and seeing the piece that I was working on outside the door because he wanted it to be the first thing I saw in the morning. He's just think, always thinking all the time of what he could do for somebody. Well, those guys just want to do something for somebody. And I remember uh, the first couple of times that I had to do something for him that he always had done himself. I remember doing a tune-up on his van one time. Hey, y'all, he didn't let anybody work on his van. He worked on his van himself. You know, but I remember doing a tune-up on his van, and I remember just how frustrated he was. Not because he didn't like me helping him, but because he didn't like being helped because he wanted to help people. And that's good, isn't it? Isn't a great thing? Uh, I, I love people like that. That just, I mean, they're just, I don't know, I don't need anything. I want to help people. I don't want people doing things for me. I want to do things for people. And I appreciate that. Paul literally had come to a place when he recognized helplessness. 
In other words, I need. I don't. I don't. Even, I can't even do what I need. I can't even take care of my needs. And Paul said the result of that was that we despaired even of life. And then he said the purpose of it was that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raised up the dead. The best thing, listen to me, the best thing that will ever help in, happen in your life is when you come to the place of recognition that you need God. You know, you don't have to be physically weak. You don't have to be mentally weak to need a Savior. You are in a place of literal despair because of your sin when you're born. That's why you need a Savior. Uh, Jesus, the Bible says, came to die for sinners. He died for the ungodly. And the Bible puts it this way, when we were yet without strength, helpless, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You say, Pastor, I don't know if I'm I don't know if I'm that helpless. I okay, let me ask you a question. What are you going to do? What are you going to do to satisfy God's wrath for your sin? What are you going to do? Well, I'll just take my punishment. That's hell. That's hell. What are you going to do to satisfy God's wrath for your sin? Well, I'm going to do good works. The Bible says that righteousness, which ignores our sin, our need for a Savior, the Bible says it is filthy rags. In other words, God literally hates good works that don't acknowledge that Jesus died for a reason. What are you going to do? You know what I did to take care of my sin? Nil. Nothing. There's nothing I could do to satisfy God's wrath. I was helpless. I literally was without strength. And coming to that place is the best thing in the world that ever happened to me. Because I realized I can't do anything. I need Jesus. The simple prayer I prayed when I was a child, God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know Jesus died for my sin. I'm asking you to save me. I want to be saved. I want to be born again. That simple prayer, my friend, was a recognition of helplessness, a recognition of need, but it produced the effect that God did what I couldn't do. Now, friend, that's the first area of, of need for any person. The greatest need any person has isn't anything physical. I don't know how often I get phone calls where people tell me what their needs are, and I try to talk to them about the things that, you know, that, that I'm equipped to help them with, that's spiritual things. And so many times they say, that isn't what I need. What I need is, they think they need money in the bank. They think they need a car. They think they need housing. They think they need food. They think they need, they need whatever. And the reality of it is, is that those are things that will recur as needs. I could meet a need and it would only be temporary. But Jesus Christ, my friend, the work of the cross is a permanent answer to my need for a Savior. I needed my sin to be paid for. Jesus died for my sin and God offered salvation as a free gift. And when I received it, my need was forever met. Now let me ask you a practical question. Let's go to our context. Is that the need Paul is mentioning about himself and about the church in Corinth? Is salvation, being saved from sin, is that the primary need Paul is talking about when he talks about being pressed beyond measure and despairing of life? No, he actually isn't. Friend, the second thing that's vital for us to recognize is not only our need of a Savior, but that we need God's help to live. We need God's help to live. Now I want to remind you about something. The moment you're born again, you have eternal life. That is, a person who knows Jesus, who has received Christ as their Savior, the Bible says is never going to perish. Matter of fact, they cannot perish. The Bible says that no man is able to pluck or pull them out of God's hand. Amen. You have eternal life. Eternal means forever, beginning from the moment you're born again. And the Bible says you'll never die. You say, Pastor, what about physical death? My friend, physical death is separation of our soul from our body. But it is not a spiritual death. 
because when we were born spiritually, when we had eternal life, we were reconciled to God eternally. It's an eternal reconciliation. Physical death can happen to those who have eternal life, but my friend, it isn't the same. It doesn't have the same problems. If a person has eternal life, they'll be re reunited with every person they're ever separated from who also has eternal life. Do you see it? Whereas physical death precludes our separation from anyone who has eternal life. Uh, it's just a temporary thing. It's like a passing. And by the way, it's <laughs> life so fast, it's very temporary. So that's our first need. But Paul is talking to the church about a physical need uh, that he had. And he's talking about physical problems that he had. It seems to be problems of persecution where literally he, he would have been killed. What happened to Paul eventually? How did, Paul end, how did Paul's end come? Yeah, we believe he was beheaded. He was killed for believing in Jesus. So how bad was Paul's persecution? We could just say deadly, right? Pressed beyond measure. And so evidently when Paul writes this letter to the church at Corinth, he is speaking in terms of saying, I didn't think I'd be alive right now, but I am. And I cannot credit my life, my physical life right now, to anything except for God's help. The circumstances I was in were more dire than any person can be delivered from. Now, I believe, and I don't want to get into this, but I believe that Paul had two missionary journeys, and I believe that he went to Rome twice. And so... It seems that Paul was released the first time from prison in Rome, and it didn't look as though he would be. But then he ended up being in prison a second time. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, dates in Acts don't account for anything except for two, uh, except for two missionary journeys by the Apostle Paul. So I think my guess is that Paul had been to Rome once, never thought he'd leave Rome, and God miraculously spared his life. That's my what I think. Now, Pastor, how much is that opinion worth? Nothing. It's not worth anything at all. Don't create a Bible doctor from it. It actually isn't important because Paul's description of his circumstances are well enough without the details, aren't they? All right, now I want to look at a couple of things though, that Paul said. Paul said, this is why God did it this way. He said, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. Do you know something God wants from believers? God wants from believers for them to trust Him instead of themselves. I could have begun this evening by asking the question, what are some great things that men can do? And we could talk about great things that men can do. You say man could do nothing without God. Technically that's true. That's technically true. But godless men can do some pretty great things. Wouldn't you agree? Mm -hmm. So great men can do great things. I believe oftentimes Christians are sidetracked by a, by a deadly tool of the Satan of being impressed by things that man can do and not impressed by things that only God can do. Do you know man uh, can build an organization? He can build a large organization. Uh, you know, we're so impressed by the mega church today, aren't we? Like the big church. I'm not, but a lot of people are. I tell people talk to me about their church. They just talk about how big it is. You know, Disney's big. Right? There are a lot of big things. China's big. Uh, you know, something being large, having a lot of people or a lot of members or a lot of in individuals involved, doesn't mean it's God doing it, right? A lot of times people talk about God, oh, God's blessing, and they're talking about something that, humanly speaking, could be done. And the fact is, is that Paul said that they were pressed beyond measure so that they could learn not to trust in anything but God. And I just want to suggest, I want to propose, I have a couple of supporting passages of Scripture we're not going to preach this evening. Uh, for your personal Bible study, you can look at a passage we looked at a couple of months ago, uh, Isaiah chapter 31, where Israel trusted in Egypt instead of trusting in God. And God asked Israel, couldn't you just trust me instead of Egypt? Couldn't you trust me instead of Egypt? We tend to trust man. We tend not to trust God. Philippians chapter 3, 3-7 is a supporting text.
text of the Scripture. But I just want to finish with this concept this evening. I want us to get this this evening. That God wants us not to trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Now let me ask you a question. If God can raise the dead, is there anything He cannot do? Can man raise the dead? No. no. Who can raise the dead? God can. So if God can raise the dead, then He can do that which no other man can do. Can you trust God? How big are your problems? We could probably vote this evening, couldn't we? We could probably compare ourselves among ourselves, which the Bible says makes us not wise. And our conclusion would be ultimately... There are things we can't do. But my friend, there's nothing God cannot do. I love that song. My God is so big. Or, my God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. I think it's a kid's song. I'm not going to make you sing it tonight, but I might Sunday morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality of it, my friend, is this. We are, prone, we are prone to use man's thinking, man's reasoning, and sometimes God brings us to a place where we're pressed beyond measure so that we do not trust in ourselves, but we trust in God. The other scripture puts it this way, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Your friend, I want to say this evening that in 2018, God can meet your need. In 2018, God is able to do what you cannot hope could be done. You first need Him as a Savior. And then, my friend, as a believer, you need to just trust Him. Trust God. Trust God. If I could get you to take a spiritual step this year that I believe would, hinder, would encourage you and not hinder you, it would be that you would trust God. Trust God. There are things probably in your life that in the past you've been convinced by God's Word that ought to be part of your life. And you haven't made a decision to take that step because you felt as though I can't. And the reason you can't is because you can't. But you've never believed God could. You can trust God. You can trust God. Father, help us to trust You. Help us to take what Paul learned and help us to apply it in a practical way. Lord, I pray if there was a theme for the believers in this ministry this year, it's that God did what man couldn't do. Help us to see this. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Did y'all hear the screaming outside? <laughs> I did. I'm going to go check on it. I want Charlie to uh, uh, take up, uh, take prayer requests. Would please you do that, please, Charlie? What's that? Please the wife out there. I know. That's why I'm going to go check. <laughs>